Hi, welcome to this video on the Anthropic Principle. What this says, in essence, is the laws of nature and fundamental constants of the universe are in some way finely tuned to make our existence possible. I'll go into it in more detail in this video, obviously, but there are different versions of the anthropic principle, for example, the weak anthropic principle and the strong anthropic principle. But first, let's have a recap of the four forces which govern our universe. The universe is governed by four interactions which have very different relative strengths. Electromagnetism, gravity, the strong interaction which gives rise to the nuclear force binding together the particles and atomic nuclei, and the weak interaction. We believe our universe is 13.8 billion years old. It began in a state of exceedingly high density, which we call the Big Bang. And it's been expanding and cooling ever since. Averaged out, the universe has an incredibly low density, equivalent to only seven atoms of hydrogen per cubic metre. Only 5% is in the form of normal matter, so that's things like atoms. The remainder of the matter is dark matter, but the biggest contribution is something called dark energy, an unknown form of energy which explains why the expansion of the universe is speeding up. Compared to other forces, gravity is incredibly weak. The force between an electron and prote proton due to gravity is 39 orders of magnitude weaker than the electrostatic interaction between them. But what would the universe look like if gravity had a very different strength? OK, so let's imagine a universe where gravity was a thousand times stronger relative to the other forces. The nuclear physics, on which of course gravity has no influence, wouldn't change. Chemistry and bonding between molecules wouldn't change either. However, the physics of large objects which are held together by gravity would be very different. Stars would need 30,000 times less mass to become hot and dense enough for nuclear reactions to start. The reason for this is because the amount of mass needed to form a star scales as the strength of gravity, the power of minus 1.5. These mini stars would have much shorter lifetimes, perhaps a few million years rather than the 10 billion life year lifetime which our sun has. If we went even further and made gravity a million times larger, the lifetime of stars would be even less, perhaps thousands of years. In such a strong gravity universe, there couldn't possibly be enough time for the evolution of complex life to have happened. OK, now let's think about how things would look if gravity were a thousand times weaker. The collapse of matter into stars would take much longer than the lifetime of our universe. There'd be no stars in a universe 13.8 billion years old. Stars would be very massive, burn more slowly and have very long lifetimes. Or perhaps stars would never form, leading to a dark universe. So instead of the universe eventually looking like this, it would always look like this. Atomic nuclei are held together by the residual strong interaction, more commonly known as the nuclear force. This binds together nucleons, by which we mean protons and neutrons, and is very short range. It doesn't follow an inverse square law, 
falls rapidly with distance, effectively dropping to zero at only three times minus 10 to the minus 15 meters. It's actually repulsive at very short distances. So an example of the nuclear force, let's consider a helium-4 nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. The blue lines show the repulsive force between the two protons, pushing them apart. The red lines show the much stronger nuclear force holding all the nucleons together. At the optimal distance of 10 to the minus 15 meters, the attractive nuclear force between two nucleons for example, a proton and a neutron is a hundred times stronger than the repulsive electrostatic force between two protons. The strength of the nuclear force enables large atomic nuclei to be built up containing many protons and neutrons. However, the short range of the nuclear force limits how big atomic nuclei can get. Consider a large nucleus such as the one shown here. Then imagine a single proton, which we're going to mark with A. This proton is only attracted to its neighbouring nucleons, so that's B, C, D, E, F and G by the, strong, by the nuclear force. The other nucleons in the nucleus will be too far away to have any significant attractive force on proton A. However, proton A will feel repulsive electrostatic force from all protons in the nucleus. As more protons are added to an atomic nucleus, the combined force of all the existing protons repelling each of them makes the nucleus more susceptible to radioactive decay. The heaviest stable nucleus is an isotope of lead, lead 2R8, which has 82 protons and 126 neutrons, all atomic nuclei heavier than this decay radioactively. The heaviest atomic nucleus found naturally on Earth is uranium 238. It is radioactive, but has a half-life of four and a half billion years roughly the same age of the Earth. All elements heavier than uranium are synthetic. And when we get up to nuclei with more than 100 protons, they are very unstable. The only known isotope of the final elements in the periodic table, organesson, which has 118 protons, has a half-life of less than one millisecond. As we've seen in our universe, lead 208 is the heaviest stable uh, nucleus and uranium 238, which has 92 protons and 146 neutrons, is reasonably stable, has a half-life roughly the same age as the life of the Earth. But in this alternative universe, the attractive nuclear force will be less effective at counteracting a repulsive electrostatic force between protons, meaning that all elements with more than five protons would be unstable. The elements to support the complex chemistry on which life is based just wouldn't exist in this universe. However, the nuclear force doesn't even have to be the full three times weaker to prevent the development of life. Barrow and Tipler point out if it was only 30% weaker, this would have two significant effects. Firstly, the nuclear reactions which occur in stars would generate significantly less energy. But even more importantly than this, deuterium, heavy hydrogen, would be unstable. Now, deuterium is an important component in the nuclear reactions which create the odd numbers elements such as nitrogen, phosphorus and sodium. So without deuterium, the abundances of these odd number elements will be very low. And these elements are essential for the chemistry of life. 
OK, if we go the other way and assume the nuclear force is 30% stronger and the electrostatic force the same strength, this means that the diproton, which is a nucleus of two protons, no neutrons, or helium-2, would be stable. In this scenario, shortly after the Big Bang, virtually all the hydrogen in the universe would have been mopped up into helium-2. Deprived of the hydrogen fuel, there'd be no long-lived stars, and as a result, no hydrogen compounds, such as water, which are essential for life. To put it simply, if the diproton exists, then we don't. More recent work has questioned whether such a small increase in the strength of the nuclear force will be sufficient to convert all the hydrogen into helium-2. Um, a paper in 2009 suggested that a 50% increase in the relative strength of the nuclear force would be needed. Even so, whether it's 13% or 50%, remains the case that a relatively modest increase in the relative strength of the nuclear force would mean that our universe could not support life. Most of the matter in the universe is in the form of dark energy. The remainder, 32%, is in the form of matter. And most of this matter is in the form of dark matter. Dark matter is the scaffolding of the universe. The visible matter, um, out of which all objects that we can see, planets, stars, galaxies, collected inside this scaffolding and eventually formed the stars and galaxies we see today. Our current theories of galaxy formation indicate that most matter in the universe must be dark matter for this to have occurred. However, if the amount of dark matter were 99% rather than 8% um, dark matter, 85% dark matter, there just wouldn't be enough ordinary matter for stars and galaxies to have formed in the first place. Or to put it another way, if there's too much or too little dark matter, then the universe would be completely dark and devoid of stars and galaxies. We've only seen three examples of fine tuning. There are many, many more. Here's just a few of them. But perhaps one of the most interesting things is why does the universe exist at all? OK, now we've looked at some examples of fine tuning. Let's go and look at a few definitions of the anthropic principle. OK, let's start with the Barrow and Tipler definition of the weak anthropic principle. One interesting fact of this definition is it highlights the fact we must live in an old universe. Life couldn't exist in a young universe, say 100 million years old, because numerous steps were needed for intelligent life to have emerged on Earth. And many of these steps took millions of years to complete. Generally speaking, the weak anthropic principle is accepted by most astronomers. In fact, one criticism of it is it's a tautology. It's not really a scientific theory, a statement that must be true. More controversial is the strong anthropic principle. Which can be expressed in another way. Without at least the potential for life, you don't have a universe. The final thing we'll look at is something called the participatory anthropic principle. This was coined by John Archibald Wheeler, who is one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. What he was saying is you can't have a universe without observers to observe it.